right, hello everyone. Welcome to the session for Firebase Cloud Messaging. My name is Sabir, and I'm the engineering lead for FCM. And I'm John. I'm the product manager for FCM. Awesome. Cool. So as most of you know, FCM is Google's reliable cross-platform message messaging service. Uh, developers use this service to send user notifications, data messages to their applications across multiple platforms. And it's also seamlessly integrated with Firebase. What that means is that multiple Firebase features like predictions, A-B testing, analytics just work seamlessly with FCM. And we'll touch base with all these today. Talking about scale, uh, the infrastructure that powers FCM uh, is supporting more than 1 million active developer accounts today. And that means these developers are sending notifications to more than 3 billion devices every week. So it's a very large scale infrastructure. Well, as Sabir mentioned, Firebase Cloud Messaging is a part of Firebase. And Firebase is a set of products that helps developers like you to build better apps to improve app stability and to grow your app from your first user to your millionth. This talk is focused on Firebase Cloud Messaging specifically, but I'd encourage you to look at the other products and features under the Firebase brand, many of which will be showcased right here at I.O. FCM is the successor to GCM, or Google Cloud Messaging. And for those of you who are familiar with GCM, and especially for those of you who rely upon it every day, have no fear. FCM builds on the exact same infrastructure as GCM and adds many great new features. In just a few minutes, we're going to talk about the new and improved client SDKs, the new Firebase integrations, and our new version Send API, which makes sending to cross-platform targets easier than ever before. All right. So before we take a deep look into all the integrations and the features that John just mentioned, I'd like to take a step back and understand some basic concepts in FCM. So the most common use case in FCM is to send a message to a particular app instance. What's happening behind the scenes here is that the SDK is getting a token from the FCM cloud. And it gets this token. Now this token gets acts as an address for this device. So whenever you want to send a message to this device, you need this token. Obviously, the apps then upload this to their servers so that when it's time to send the message, server knows how to reach this device. Server has to authenticate with FCM and send the message. FCM Cloud figures out how to route this message to this particular app instance, regardless of what platform it is on. Another popular uh, feature in FCM is topic messaging. And a lot of developers use this feature when their use cases are to send the same type of notification to a large number of devices. Uh, common examples can be sending a news app notification to uh, folks interested in certain topics, a sports app, for example, notifying, hey, there's an update on your team that you follow, et cetera. In this case, every device subscribes to topic. It's a one-line code on the client side. And instead of sending one message per device, you only send one message to FCM Cloud, and it's fanned out to all the devices subscribed to this. And this makes it really easy and uh, scalable for developers to reach a large number of devices. Another way of sending and receiving messages from FCM is to open a persistent connection from your application server to the FCM Cloud. Now, you can do this using the XMPP endpoint that we have. You can send messages to topics or directly to devices on this connection. And you can also receive messages from your application. A popular uh, use case for this is when developers want to notify that their application has actually received a message. So they can make other changes or send follow-up notifications, et cetera. Right? So we talked about scale earlier. And I would like to highlight that latency is super important to us. We would we'll want to <laughs> deliver your messages as fast as possible, as long as the devices are connected. Now, the numbers you see here are the in-network latency numbers. That means time when the notification gets to the FCM backend until it's dispatched on the carrier channel. And any change we make in our infrastructure, we're committed to not impact these negatively. Earlier in the presentation, we promised to give you a look at the latest and greatest Firebase integrations. And that's exactly what we're going to do now. So Firebra uh, FCM integrates deeply and seamlessly with all of the Firebase products, including analytics, A-B testing, predictions, and more. And these products all work together synergistically to help you produce more effective 
more understandable notifications for your users. So let's walk through a quick demo of those new features. So let's say that I'm an app owner, and my app works by uh, encouraging team-based competition. So my users will have some sort of an army, maybe a robot army, uh, and, and they're going to fight against other armies, like the Sparky army. And uh, each team basically competes to get to the top of the leaderboard. Fame and fortune ensue. Uh, they can buy upgrades to their army with a premium currency that I call Battle Bucks. So one of the things that I like to do as an app owner is to send notifications to my users to bring them back into the game. Uh, and I'm particularly interested in sending notifications to my paying users because they're the ones who actually keep the lights on in my company. So I have this idea that sending a message that appeals to team loyalty is going to be the best way to talk to these users. And it's going to be better than the status quo that I have. So what I'm going to want to do is to build an A-B test to test that theory. And here you see in this, uh, in this UI screen the, the beginnings of my A-B test, where I'm setting up all the parameters. This is an actual UI screen from the Firebase console, uh, where you can set up such an A-B test. So uh, I'll walk through some of these uh, different um, items on the screen so you can understand what's going on. First, we have the experiment name, which is really for me, so I don't lose track of what my test is trying to do. It's the theme text test, which I practiced saying many times before I got up on stage today. And the description is to test team. <laughs> no, I didn't, uh, didn't practice enough. Test team theme text versus status quo. I actually set up that problem for myself, so I have no one to blame. Um, this is going to be targeted towards my paying users using uh, Firebase predictions. So with Firebase predictions, another Firebase product, I'm actually able to target the subset of my users who are predicted to spend based on their history within my app. So automatically, and by integrating the Firebase SDK, I get access to Firebase predictions, and it's just a few clicks to turn it on. Here I'm going to be targeting my users who are predicted to spend real money in my app, because they're the, they're the users I care about for this test. And I'm going to send it to 5% of those users so I can test this on a smaller population before rolling out more broadly. So one quick point I'd like to highlight there is that if you have uh, Google Analytics events for spend, and you've turned on predictions, you don't have to do anything in your SDK on top of that. Predictions are available to you, and we'll create these spend and churn buckets for you. So, All right. Very true. Uh, so as you proceed through the flow, this just kind of sets up the variance of my A-B test. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with A-B testing, you essentially just have different experiences, A, B, maybe C, that your users can see. and. Uh, you just look at the, the metrics of interest for each of those groups within your audience, and whichever set of metrics you like the most, that's the experience that you know is having the impact you want it to have. So uh, this is essentially the three variants that I've got set up in this test that I was describing earlier. I've got a variant A, which is going out to 33% um, of, of the users in the test. And that's the old status quo. It's my boring old text that says, get 20% off Battle Bucks, pretty generic. And then I've got variant B, which is the new uh, hot version of my text, which says, hey, Sparky, get 20% off Battle Bucks with this code. Uh, so that's appealing to the uh, team spirit and, and the affinity that they'll have for their team. I think, as a product manager, maybe that's going to do better than the old way of doing things. Uh, both of these are going to be compared against the control group, which is no message at all. And at the end of this experiment, all of our deltas in our metrics, user engagement, those will be measured relative to not uh, receiving a message of any sort. All right. All right. More screens. So uh, in just a few clicks, you set up the goal for the test. My goal is user engagement. I want my paying users to come into the app. So that's the goal I set. I also want to check a few other metrics, like uh, retention and purchase revenue, so I can have a more holistic view of what's going on with this experiment. And I'm going to look at all of these metrics together uh, after my test is concluded to, to be sure that the, the winning variant is really winning on all counts. So 
sometime in the future, about seven days later, after I've sent out those messages to those different groups, I'm going to have a, a screen that looks something like this, which tells me about the actual results of the experiment. And what do you know? It turns out that the theory was, was right. Uh, the themed text was the clear leader for this experiment, and it actually did outperform the status quo and the control group. Uh, so that had a, an improvement over control for user engagement. I'd also be able to dive into some of the other metrics, like purchase revenue, to make sure that that wasn't strangely adversely impacted or anything like that. But uh, once I'm satisfied that variant C is actually the winner, theme text, it's very easy for me to roll that out to the remaining population of my app by clicking the big blue button up at the top of the screen that says roll out the leader. And then that message will go out to the remaining uh, people in my app who haven't seen the message. Awesome. So as we know, FCM is cross-platform service. That means you can send notifications to Android, iOS, and web applications. Uh, late last year, we announced a new API, which makes it even simpler. And what this API allows us to do is to override platform-specific parameters in a single request. What it also allows you to do is uh, service account-based authentication. So if you use any other Google API, uh, you probably are familiar with it. It's pretty standard. It gives you short-lived tokens to authenticate with our service, et cetera. And it's also integrated with Firebase Admin SDK. So if you're a user of Firebase Admin SDK, all these features are already available. You have the convenience methods for authentication, sending messages using this API, et cetera. There is a deep dive into Admin SDK and a talk on that later today. So if, and they're going to demo uh, some FCM uh, things with it. So if you are interested, please uh, attend that. So let's take an example of this API. Let's say you want to send a message to your topic for sale watchers. Now, these are people interested in sales. You can uh, include the main uh, items like title and body in the main notification body. And now, if you want to specify what will happen if somebody clicks on this notification, on Android, you have a field called click action to tell which activity to open. So you can specify that in the Android uh, message section. And then on iOS, this field is called category. Um, same purpose, but different name. So you can specify that in the APN as part of it. And you can specify your platform-specific fields here. They will be passed as is to the platform so that they are uh, rendered the way you expect them to. This API is extendable. You can also specify web parameters here. We can also add more platforms in the future. So I highly recommend you checking this out. All right. So we talked a lot about Firebase cloud messaging and its integrations in different features. Um, if you're already on FCM, you already have access to all this good stuff. So job well done. Congrats. <laughs> but if you haven't moved from GCM yet, it's time to upgrade. All right, so let's uh, walk through quickly on the steps that are needed to move from GCM to FCM. And I'll cover each of these uh, quickly. First is to have a few clicks on the Firebase console and add your apps uh, to Firebase. So for each Android application, you'll have to enable Firebase for that application. Uh, just to mention, these steps are specific to Android. Next step is to uh, change your dependencies. So instead of uh, in the build Gradle file, instead of using Play Services GCM, you should move to Firebase Messaging. Just a one-line change. And now the fun stuff. Let's start taking things out of our manifest. So you don't need to declare any permissions with FCM. Uh, these are automatically handled by the SDK. So you can just take these out. And if you're using GCM, you probably had these receivers. You don't need these anymore either. You can take them out. Uh, the FCM SDK automatically merges in the receivers it needs. So on the server side, when you talk to the FCM cloud, uh, you should update the endpoints to the FCM endpoints. We highly recommend you doing this. The request response format is the same. Uh, your request will, be, will continue to work as is. You just need to update your URLs. And lastly, some code changes on the client side. And you need to move to the new messaging service, uh, Firebase messaging service. It has the same method for when you receive a message called on message received. So all your logic remains the same. And you also need to move to the Firebase instance ID service, which also has the same method as before, like on token refresh. That's it. That's it. That was easy. So right? easy. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we have a migration guide at the link mentioned here if you want more details. Uh, and it also covers other platforms. OK. Well, that is not so bad. 
but we have picked up a couple tips along the way that we'd like to share with you, starting with the first one. Let FCM manage your registration retry logic. It used to be the case that in GCM, it's possible to, um, to not get a valid registration token back from the GCM cloud. In FCM, we automatically handle all of the retry logic for you, so you don't need to replicate the old code that you would have had in your GCM implementation. So just let FCM handle it. It'll do it. Uh, second tip, avoid using GCM and FCM in the same app at the same time because they'll try to do the same things and potentially conflict with each other. So when you're moving from GCM to FCM, just start clean. Clean out your GCM implementation and put the FCM implementation in place. That's the way to do it. The third tip, store one token per app instance. They are mutually interchangeable between GCM and FCM, so you don't need to maintain separate lists of tokens between GCM and FCM. All you need is one list of tokens. They're just tokens. And when you replace a GCM token for a particular app instance, make sure you replace that token uh, rather than appending it to the list or doing something else. Uh, those tokens do translate to the same app instance. And finally, make sure that you're periodically refreshing your tokens so you get a valid token at all times. And Sabir has some more details about that last point. I do. Uh, so fun stat, we receive around 40% notifications for devices and tokens which are invalid. These are tokens which have been unregistered. They have been invalidated by other platforms, et cetera. And this is basically extra load on your servers plus our servers. You are storing these tokens. You don't have a fresh state of your devices. So how can we fix it? Well, we can do two things. First is to have the observers in the on-token refresh method. This is an example on iOS. So when you get uh, the on-token uh, refresh method invoked, you should upload uh, the latest token to your server and override the state on the server as soon as possible. That way, you always have the most accurate uh, way to reach your devices. Again, this is the code on Android. Uh, same logic. When you get on token refresh, you get the token, upload it to your server. Second thing you can do is periodically refresh your tokens. And what this means is, like at some frequency, just keep uploading the tokens from your device to the server so you at all times have a, a fresh state on the server side. And also, you clean up the tokens uh, that you had uh, previously, which are not being used anymore. Um, the frequency depends on the, your use cases, but we recommend anything between two to four weeks should be good enough. All right. With that said, uh, let's do a quick poll. By raise of hands, who here cares about delivery and battery impact? All right. Most of you raise your hands. That's a good sign. Uh, so uh, let's talk a, a little bit more in detail on how we can get the best performance from FCM. And for that, let's have Todd Hansen on stage. All right. Thank you, Sabir. Hey, John. Hey, Todd. All right. So for the rest of the session today, I'm basically going to ask Todd all of my burning questions about FCM performance so he can tell us all how to make high-performing apps with FCM. And I'll start with our very first question here. Todd, please tell us, what are the newest versions of Android doing to improve battery life, and what are the implications for FCM? OK. Um, so um, Android versions as recent or as far back as Marshmallow can be doing things that impact your battery life. Um, let's examine those and um, see what those changes are. And then we'll also talk about how you can make sure that FCM continues to perform well in your app. So Marshmallow and Nougat introduced Doze and Doze on the Go battery saving features, which disabled some activities when the screen was turned off. Um, we introduced two FCM message priorities to allow users or, or allow apps to decide whether the message should be able to wake the device up when it's in Doze or not. Um, then comes Oreo. Oreo added um, background check, which um, prevents the apps from running in the background for too long. So this means that you can run in the background for a short period of time, and then after that, you can't run in the background longer. Um, we also introduced a temp whitelist, which allows you to, um, to access the network for a few seconds after receiving a high priority message. Um, neither of these were intended to be sufficient for all applications on all network conditions, um, which we'll talk about more in a few minutes. Um, in November, existing apps in the Play Store will be required to target O 
Um, so many of you are just now starting to deal with these challenges as you're updating your apps. We're here to help. Android P introduces App Standby Buckets. App Standby Buckets group apps based on their recency of use and the frequency of use, and provides restrictions so that apps that aren't used as frequently will be less co consuming of battery. Um, App Standby Buckets also changes how FCM works a little bit. In effect, it means that FCM high priority messages should only be used for things that will generate a user interaction, such as a notification or uh, ringing a phone or something. So this is a snapshot from a coworker's device. Um, and it shows you how different apps can be categorized based on the recency and, again, the um, frequency at which they're used. Um, this particular coworker clearly has Gmail in the rare bucket. Um, and I sent him an email to find out why, but he hasn't gotten back to me. Um, uh, so tomorrow there's a talk that talks more about app standby buckets in depth in general. Um, that's a great place to go. For now, we're going to concentrate on FCM's impact, or the impact to FCM. So this table shows um, app standby buckets um, for, and their impact on high priority messages. Um, you can see that message, message priority, or messages have different quotas for different buckets. Um, so clearly, if you're in a rare bucket, you're only going to get five messages per day. Um, if you exceed that amount, the messages will be delivered as normal priority. But there's more. If you display a notification, your application moves to the working set. And that means that effectively, if you only use high priority messages for displaying a notification or other user interactions, you won't be limited at all by this change. Um, in addition, if the app is opened, um, it'll move to the active bucket. And so similarly, it won't be affected at all. So the situations in which you will potentially run into challenges is when, um, say, you display a notification to a disabled channel or when you use a high priority message to trigger background work. In those situations, you do not change your app standby buckets, and you could run into these limits. All right, next question for Todd. So just to summarize, when should I use high priority, and when should I use normal priority? OK, and the basic rule has been the same since Marshmallow. Use high priority messages only for situations in which you'll generate a user interaction, such as a notification. Um, in addition, I also want to point out that um, you should not you should not expect to be able to call, to your server, call home to your servers to get additional content before displaying a notification, as the, um, the background service may time out. All right, great. So if I'm feeling maybe a little bit lazy, what happens if I just leave everything in my app exactly how it is today? Like, what's the problem with that? So let's look at an example, and I'll propose a solution for you. OK, we'll start by looking at a simple chat app. The main premise of this simple chat app is after, displaying, or after receiving a high priority message, it goes and contacts the servers to download additional content before displaying a notification. Let's see what happens when it targets Oreo. So we start to see some notifications not showing up. It's not very high, and we don't, maybe don't notice right away, but we start to get some complaints accumulating. So as we start to investigate, we find that 5% of notifications are lost because the network access times out before we can even connect to our servers. And we look further, and we find another 5% of notifications are lost because the um, background service times out before we can even complete retrieving all of the content. So sooner or later, you've got an angry boss wondering why your app is broken. All right. Well, that's a big problem. <laughs> so a 10% loss rate is pretty bad. Um, we could try and brute force this. We could solve this maybe by letting the app run for a lot longer. Um, to get the r failure rate down to under 1%, we have to let the app run for seven minutes in response to each message. So clearly, that's a lot of battery spend that we're costing users. Um, it could be possible that you know, a user on a poor quality network would have a really bad experience having their app run for seven or their device run for seven minutes for every message. And they might prefer to choose when to download that content. So let's go further. OK. Follow-up question. Since background runtime can be limited, what's the right way to ensure that my notifications are actually going to be seen by all of my users? 
So clearly, we need a better solution. And let's go into that now. So what we will do is we'll re-implement the app to implement graceful degradation. And graceful degradation is meaning that we'll always display the notification, even if we can't get the content from the servers. So the following steps of graceful degradation are here. First, you display a notification immediately. You can often use the payload of, F of an FCM message to display the content. Um, if, if that's not sufficient, you can display a placeholder. Then you schedule a job to go and collect the information in the background. Um, if that job completes, then you can update the notification if that's appropriate. If the user opens the app before the job completes, then you would display a spinner and start the job immediately to collect that data. If you do this right, I believe that very few users will actually notice this difference. And those few users will be on poor quality networks. And so they will appreciate the extra battery savings. Great. So I, I think I understand how to handle downstream messages now. Can you tell me how these background limits apply to client to server messages? Yes. So um, background restrictions apply to whenever your app is running in the background, regardless of what you're doing. So our simple chat app sends outgoing messages using a background service. And so we see that sometimes that background service times out before the message is sent, especially if we have to retry sending the message multiple times because of, say, a, ne ne a network issue or something. So one solution that you could do is you could use a foreground service to send these messages. However, a better solution would probably be to use FCM upstream messaging, um, which handles the work for you in a more efficient manner. It handles the retries and maintaining the connection and ensuring that the message gets there. OK, Todd. Well, there's more to life than Android, as this message or this uh, drawing here somehow demonstrates. I'm not sure exactly how. But do you have some more general tips about understanding and improving the performance of FCM? Yes. So let's walk through the flow of a message through FCM. So this diagram, as we saw before, shows how you're sending a message from your servers through FCM to the device. Um, we'll start by examining when you send messages to FCM servers. As Sabir already alluded to, 40% of messages are targeted at inactive devices. Those are devices that haven't connected to our servers in over a month. Some engineers think that deleting registration tokens upon receiving error not registered is sufficient to solve this. However, we only send error not registered when we are absolutely certain that that registration is no longer valid. So that means that you can accumulate a large list of invalid or inactive device registrations in your registration list. Um, a better solution is to periodically refresh your FCM token, again, something that Sabir talked about earlier. Um, this will often return the same token, although it may update it in certain conditions. Um, but most importantly, this refreshes your registration targets so that you can easily start to identify inactive devices by looking at which ones haven't registered recently. OK, so I clear out my old registrations that haven't connected in a long time. So I have just uh, one more question for you. Earlier, Sabir said that mean latency for FCM is around 70 milliseconds. And when I test my app, I often find that I experience latencies over 300 milliseconds. What's up? <laughs> OK, let's look at the messages as they depart FCM servers to the device. Um, network latency adds significantly to the latency that you observe. Um, for example, the 80 percentile latency for FCM servers to dispatch, dispatch a message to you is 120 milliseconds. However, when we add network latency into account, we find that latency jumps to 300, 350 milliseconds. So given your 300 milliseconds, I think you should, should probably get a better network. All right. Come on, Google. Uh, I was lying earlier about one last question. This is my real last question right here. So, uh, I don't get messages when my phone is turned off. I think most people are probably in the same boat. Are a lot of message deliveries affected by this same situation? Yeah, so what we see is that um, you know, device availability varies dramatically around the globe. But on an average, we see about 11% of messages are delivered to devices that haven't been connected in the last hour. So that means that when you're sending messages to devices, some a portion of your devices could be as high as 11%, could be higher, depending on where you're located, are offline at that point. And they'll receive the message when they get online. And so we really do recommend that you take those users into account and 
make the app work well even when the users aren't available. There could be reasons that they're doing that, like an airplane ride or something like that. Yes, that's what I do. OK, well, thank you very much, Todd, for all of your great answers to our performance questions. If you'd like to learn more about FCM or if you'd just like to stop by and say hello, we'll be in tent B, or sorry, Office Hours tent table B tomorrow morning at 8.30 AM until 9.30 AM. We'll be there smiling with a cup of coffee. Please come and see us. And finally, oh, well, wait, back. That's the one. We want to hear from you. <laughs> Uh, we'd love to hear your feedback on this session. Please go to the link on the screen, uh, google.com slash io slash schedule. Leave some feedback. We'd love to know what you thought. Thank you.